there's many a times playing semi-pro football, running down the line, and you know you've got young kids on the sideline saying, "Oh, a suicide bomber," calling you, going to a stadium, walking in, and people calling you Bin Laden. This used to happen all the time. Okay. But it's just how you how you deal with it, how you tackle those things. Um, and in 2001, uh, when this was all going on, there was quite a few people looking at us and thinking, "Oh, what's going on here? Like these guys are getting discriminated." Obviously, uh, you know, 9/11 has happened, and what's going on? This this something's <coughs> not right here. Mm. So we was followed by the BBC for a, a whole year. So they made a documentary about myself and two guys uh, about being Muslim and playing football uh, in, in the UK. Mm. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakum la khair for coming, bro. And your name is Urfat. It's Urfat, yes. Okay, tell, tell me about the name because I've never heard of such a name. Okay, so there's a bit of a story behind my, 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 behind my name, alhamdulillah. Um, my father, uh, when he was married to his first wife um, back in Pakistan, um, he never had any children. Okay, so he never had any children. And then my father... Uh, was brought to the UK as a skilled worker. Um, when he came over here, uh, he went back to Pakistan and he married again and he married my mum. And just in Pakistani culture, generally, obviously, you know, everyone wants to have children, have boys and whatever. You know, it's just a cultural thing, mm -hmm. not really a, a religious, religious thing. Yeah, of course. Um, so what happened is my father's, uh, my, my mum first had a boy um, and the boy, uh, had it, it was a stillbirth. So he, he died at birth. Um, then my father had consecutively um, three daughters. So one after the other, he had three daughters. And then my father, obviously, he wanted a, he wanted a son. He wanted to continue his, you know, his, his name, his lineage. Again, cultural thing, mm -hmm. a Pakistani cultural thing. Um, so he went to Hajj um, and he made dua that uh, on, on the plains of Arafah, that if he ever had a son, he would name him after Arafah. Okay, the day of Arafah. That's right. And that's where my name came from. Mm. How we got to Urfa was after I was born, um, obviously my father being a carpenter by trade um, and being, you know, illiterate to a certain degree, um, went to the registry office and uh, said to the lady that, look, I've had a son, this is his name. She said, can you spell it for me? Yeah. England? In England, yeah. Okay. Can you spell it for me? And um, obviously he couldn't spell the name right. So she just said, okay, shall I just call it, shall I just put it Urfa? And he said, okay, no problem. <laughs> Sounds the same. It's okay. <laughs> so instead of even being with an A, yeah, so a. it goes a little bit like Arafat. It's not. It's actually a with a U. Oh, so, U. Yeah. So it became Urfa. Oh. So a lot of people actually do say that to me. A lot of people do say, "Is that like a Turkish name? Like you got yeah, yeah, Turkish, sounds Turkish family?" But no, 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 it's completely and utterly Pakistani. <laughs> <laughs> so it's meant to be Arafat. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, so, so you know when it went, you know, alhamdulillah, I've had the privilege uh, and, uh, and 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 the honor to be able to go to Hajj many Shabbat. times with with a Hajj group as a tour guide. And um, when I go, a lot of people uh, ask me my name because I'm tour guiding them, I'm helping them out and stuff. So a lot of them ask me, what's your name? So I say, my name's Arafat. And you know, before you go to the to, to the day of Arafat, they always say to me, everyone always says, brother, please remember me. You know, when you go to, <laughs> when you go to Arafat, please remember me. Remember. I say, I say, wallahi, I'm going to be very honest with you. I cannot remember 250 names, no. but wallahi, I know for a fact that you're going to be on Arafat. No, and you're going to remember me. <laughs> yeah. And then alhamdulillah, they do. The name. Yeah, so from the name, they remember me. Okay. So give us a bit background and where are you from originally? Obviously you already said Pakistan. Was you born then in Pakistan or born here? No, I was born here, yeah. Okay. So I was born and raised uh, in East London, um, Cockney boy, uh -huh. uh, lived all my life in the same area in East Ham, um, lived in the same house. Uh, uh, I'm the only son. Uh, yeah, you said I've, three sisters, weren't yeah, you? Yeah, I got three sisters. Um, I had four sisters, but one of my sisters sadly passed away in a car accident. No, no, um, no. But I have, alhamdulillah, three sisters. Um, I'm the, I'm in the middle of one younger than me. Okay. Um, yeah, that's me, man. What about, you said the other side, your dad already had the first wife. So yeah. That yeah. side, you still also got brothers and sisters from your dad's side? No, zero. He didn't have no kids? No kids from. from okay. Side, so, no. I don't know. so just all from your mum? Yeah, yeah. And obviously my mum, obviously, um, we kind of never saw her anyway because we was born here. All my sisters, myself, we were all born in the UK. So my dad used to take us back and forth from Pakistan um, quite a lot. Um, sorry, I should just add my, my, my dad passed away when I was seven years old. Mm. So um, my dad passed away when we were very young. Uh, my eldest sister, I think she was only 10 or 11 years old at that time. Um, 
so at the time my father was alive, we were very young. So we used to go to and from Pakistan quite a bit um, and see family and stuff, but not really see any extended family too much. My father used to take us to the same places because um, he wanted us to keep our, you know, sort of our Pakistani culture, you know, sort of intact. Mm. Um, hence the reason why we all can speak fluent Punjabi, the language that we speak. Um, and obviously we speak English and, and mm. stuff. So. so just a question. So did, um, when your father passed away, Rahimahullah, did mum come here? Mum was already here. Oh, mum was already here. Yeah, mum was already here. Father went back. My dad went back to Pakistan like he used to regularly. I think you meant you couldn't, he, he didn't see the other mum. Yeah, I didn't see her. Yeah, oh, yeah, okay, see her. okay. So my father went back to Pakistan, routine, see his sister and whatever. And he sadly had a heart attack while he was there uh, and passed away. How old was he? He was probably at that time around sort of 38, 39. Yeah. He was That's young. young, man. Yeah, he was young, yeah. But my father, you know, my father, if you, if you, if I think about it now, um, my, 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 my dad was a, he was a carpenter by trade. Um, it was built like a brick house. Like he was six foot two, big guy, big belly, big hands. You know, like that's how my father was. Um, so obviously I didn't take any, so I, no. <laughs> I didn't take anything really from my father. But apart from the fact that everyone says that I look a lot like, look a lot like my dad. And mm. um, I've got a lot of uh, re resemblance to my dad. But my father, like I said, he passed away when I was very, very, very young. Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't really get to see my dad too much, you know. Um, it was just one of those things. Mum brought us up and... Uh, you know, son of a of a, of, of, of my mum, innit? So mm. did that. Um, you, you know, even the Prophet was an orphan. Yeah. And uh, when the ulama speak about that, they said there was a wisdom behind what uh, you know that what Allah Taala wanted to achieve through that. Yeah. So he became a man who was kind of like very kind, merciful to the orphans and to the widows and so on. But just going back to yourself, did that have an impact on your childhood? Dad not being around. You said you were seven years old. Yeah. The oldest sister was 18, did you say? No, she was about 11, 12 11, old, so yeah. very young. So there's a pressure on mum. But what about yourself? Did that have an impact? Did you kind of like uh, go through difficulties because of that? Sheikh, to be honest with you, uh, you know, at that time, um, life was very difficult. My mum was uh, in the country, couldn't speak the language. Um, we've obviously just lost our dad. Uh, me and my younger sister were very young, so we didn't really understand what was going on. We couldn't go back to Pakistan to see my dad, you know, at his burial or anything like that. We couldn't afford it. Didn't have the money to be able to go and do stuff like that. So that transition, I think, you know, um, I can only thank Allah and thank my mum for that, you know, that my mum never, ever let us feel the sort of the pinch of not having your dad around. You know, my mum literally became um, a mum and a dad overnight, you know, uh, and, and she was, she was, alhamdulillah, so strong in, in her, in her in her demeanor and how she was and how she carried herself, that from being someone who came to this country also at a very young age, being married to my father, um, had no skills, um, couldn't read or write, left in a country with four children, what's she gonna do? How is she gonna survive? Um, and that survival that she had at that time probably made us the people that we are today. Mm. Um, overnight, learning how to uh, um, sew on machines, um, getting trained to do so, and you know, I don't know. So sorry, was trying to find a skill to make money. Yeah, yeah, make money, and mm -hmm. and 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 the thing is that she she used to do it from home. Mm -hmm. So she she bought a machine, she put it in the house, got trained, started learning how to uh, to sew. And let me tell you now, right? I'm 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 for, I'm forty seven. I'm forty seven now. If I think back now, if I if I if I think back now, uh, at the age of forty seven, my mom got all of us married. My mum paid the house. Um, my mum learned how to drive. My mum spoke speaks English, um, and she brought everyone up. Mm. So how she did that, um, and also that that coming from someone who I remember going to sleep at night, um, and my mum put us all to bed, and then she would be still on the machine. Wake up in the morning, and she'll be on the machine. She'll take us to school, and she'll come back and be, be on the machine. She'll go pick us up from school, come back, and she'll be back on the machine. So all of those kind of things, those difficulties that we had in our life, mm. um, we had them um, to a certain degree. But Alhamdulillah, my mom, you know, um, may Allah bless her, you know, may Allah preserve her. You know, she was she was a, a, a soldier, mm. you know, in, in all of those things. Yeah, she made sure that we never went without anything, you know. Inshallah. I'm not saying that we were overly privileged with the best clothes and the best trainers and, you know, uh, all of those kind of things. But my mom never, ever let us 
feel like if we wanted something, we didn't get it. Mm. Just worked very hard for it. Mm. So just another question on that. Were there any like uh, paternal uncles, maternal uncles, like men around to give that extra support? You know, to, to yourselves or no, we just mum and you yourselves. No, it was just it was it was we we had some extended family, extended family in Birmingham, and extended family that my dad had made friendships with and stuff like that. But they're not direct family, so they you know they were supportive. Um, I've got a few cousins that were very supportive um, at that time, but again, they were also very young, so we kind of had that network of like young guys just growing up together and just making sure that we just made ends meet, um, and. Uncle, uncles, my uncle came like later on into the country, but again, he came here, my mum's brother, he wanted to make his own life. You know, he wanted to get married himself, wanted to make his own life, have his own children and whatever. And it's only so much, I mean, we've all been brought up here. It's only so much someone can help you. Mm -hmm. You know, in this country, you have to like, you have to go out and help yourself. Yeah, yeah. You know, you got to be the breadwinner yourself. Mm -hmm. No one's going to, no one's going to do it for you. Mm -hmm. But obviously we had to, we, we, we had to, I mean, I remember speaking to a brother recently and, and he was telling me about how he struggled um, or his family struggled. And I was telling him that, you know, even up to the, the age of 18, 19, we didn't even know what chicken and chips was. Mm -hmm. We didn't know what pizza was mm -hmm. because we'd never ate out. Okay, we mom. always ate, mum always cooked at home. Yeah, yeah. You go to people's houses these days and, you know, Asian culture, you know, there's all types of food made. But Alhamdulillah, we eat everything. Like I got people that around me that say, no, no, I don't eat that. No, no, I don't touch that. You know? But alhamdulillah, we, we ate everything because mum always made us eat everything. Mm. Whatever's on the table yes, is what we're all going to eat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're all going to eat together. And that's the way it is. And hence the same thing I've done with my own children. Oh, you right. know, whatever it is, it's on the table. Mm. Is That's what you eat, man. Alhamdulillah. How's life in the area? So obviously you're born here and all of that. How was the culture, like the community, the people that you was around at that young age? It was difficult. Um, growing up in the 80s, um, East Ham sort of, Manor Park, all them areas was difficult. Obviously, there was obviously a lot of um, lot of racism, um, but I think a lot of that had kind of like started to go away. But for myself, I think my my, my journey um, from primary school was always engrossed in football. So because I was always involved in football, so from a, from a young age, from the age of seven, I, I was playing league football. Mm -hmm. So I was always kind of like that guy that was always known for football as well. So no one really like, I, I didn't really get bothered much. Um, I had friends around me, you know, some of these guys, you know, they were on drugs. They were all on all types of madness going on in the areas. But again, mum, go training, come home. Mm -hmm. You're not allowed out late. Whereas my friends were out all the time. They were, you know, gallivanting on streets, doing all types of madness. But with us, mum was very strict. No, no, no. You know, you're, you're a single boy. You come home. We look after your home. And that's the best way. And also my cousins that I mentioned earlier, um, they, were, they were a few years older than me. And uh, they never, ever let me... Uh, uh, get involved in sort of, uh, you know, gangs or bad characters. They never let me get around those guys. If they ever used to see me, they used to say, what are you doing? Grab me, take me home, mm. you know, get home, get home to get home to mum, mm. um, see what's going on at home, whatever. So I kind of like from being seven, eight, nine years old, uh, it was almost like like being that oh, big brother, dad kind of thing from early days for me. It was, it was, you you it was were sheltered like, in some way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whether it's by your cousins, and all by your mum. But at the same time, there's a level, obviously, self-awareness as well to respect your parent because we've had many guests on the show. And even as we know, many youngsters that they'll be single parents. And yes, the mum could be the best mum, the hardest mum, but they'll still go and do what they want to do. Yeah. So there has to be a level of, you know, yourself, maybe you respect your mum enough to listen to your mum as well. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? So the thing is, look, when, when, you're, when you've got a single parent, you kind of subliminally think you could do whatever you feel like it. Mm. You can go out and do whatever you feel. But my saving grace, alhamdulillah, obviously Allah protected us a lot, protected me a lot, alhamdulillah. But I think my my, my grace was, it was, it was football. Because mm. I was so engrossed in training, um, playing for clubs, um, wanted to achieve, wanted to, you know, get up the football ladder, that the people around me were kind of on the same sort of mindset. Mm. So when people are out, you know, um, I don't know, smoking or whatever, I never did all those things because mm -hmm. I had to go training. Of course. Yeah, so I never got involved in any of those kind of things. And also, we had good brothers around us. And then, you know, uh, you know, I like to shout out someone like Brother Hashim. He was a, a youth worker in our area at the time. Um, and his brother, mashallah, you know, he used to come by us all the time. He was a lot older than us. He used to come by us all the time. 
you know, get us involved in football, get us involved in sports, take us to Margate and whatever. And it was just all outreach work, which to be honest, they were just doing it, and even not even for Dawa. They were just doing it because they just didn't want the community in the area to go astray. Mm. And people like him, alhamdulillah, you know, they helped us a lot. Um, stay off uh, the bad sort of society and stay away from the bad society. Mm -hmm. So how did a football career go then, since you was good at it from a young age? Yeah, so from, from young, um, obviously I, I played for my school team. Um, I was I was doing trials at different, different clubs. Um, I was trialling out for many, many different clubs, but ending up, I ended up at West Ham. Mm. Um, I was there for quite some time. Uh, but obviously being a sort of Asian uh, player in the area, um, I was obviously boosted up quite a lot by, by, by my fellow colleagues and uh, coaches and, 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 uh, and managers and stuff. Yeah. But it was difficult, very, very difficult at the time. I, I just feel that, I mean, it, as much as cultures change now, Cultures change now in terms of like players getting involved and 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 getting into the into the football scene right now, especially coming from the South Asian subcontinent. It was very very difficult then. You know, we used to go go training and be playing with Rio and playing with Joe Cole and these guys, and they were always the the guys that these guys were looking at. They were never never looking at any anyone else. So mm. um, got released, um, never got a scholar, uh, never got a pro, um, moved on. And then just played, uh, started playing amateur football and just lost the love of it. Just thought, you know what, this is not meant to be, it's not meant to be. Um, and just lost the love of it and thought, you know what, now I'm 16, 17 years old, I need to start working. Mm -hmm. I need to start helping mum. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you know, things are not going to, things are going to just go a bit, go a bit wrong. Yeah. So I got a job, uh, started working uh, at, at B&Q uh, in, in Beckton as a, as a part-time guy, studying part-time. Uh, and then slowly, slowly, alhamdulillah, I progressed in 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 my in my work life, um, and I started earning decent money, helping mum out, you know, uh, helping the, helping my sisters and stuff. And uh, then football came back on the scene, and then uh, I, I played a few games for a few few people that I knew, a few clubs that I knew, and then um, I got I got scouted, started playing for another team, uh, and then played semi pro football all the way from uh, I think 24, 25 all the way up to 35 years old. I, I played semi-pro. Mm. Uh, I played the Kent Senior League. I played in the Essex Senior League. I played up step four, step five. Um, uh, and just continue that journey. And uh, semi-pro, you get paid, I assume, obviously. Yeah, not every club you get paid. Some you do, some you don't. It just depends on what, what level they are. Okay. What, what, what level they are. Um, I did I did see if I could try to jump back up. But unfortunately, at the age of 24, I tore my anterior cruciate ligament in my knee. Um, so that set me back a little bit mm. um, for a couple of years. That set me back, um, and then once the knee recovered and everything, alhamdulillah, I went back and and started playing again. So in between that though, because obviously if, they, if they're paying and some of them are not paying, how was you supporting yourself and your mum? Because I was still working. Okay. Because with semi pro, you can play part time. Yeah. And obviously you can still work. So I was still working at that time. Got you. So I could carry on working, doing my work life as well as um, as well as supporting my mum with my mm. and, and uh, with with work it was they were very flexible with it because they knew that I played football so if I needed to ever leave early they would let me go mm. if I had a midweek game they would just say to me if I had to travel far they would just let me go mm. there was there was quite uh, flexible yeah they're very flexible about it mm. alhamdulillah yeah they're mm. very good with me alhamdulillah how was obviously we said you're muslim so how was the world of practicing at that time for you whilst at the same time football um it was hard in the beginning, very, very difficult. Um, I think in 2000, year 2000, 2001, um, I actually got, uh, I went to some trials and I got picked to go to play for the Pakistan national team, which gave me a quite a good profile in, in going away and obviously uh, having some sort of credibility in, in, in what I did. Um, coming back to the UK meant that um, I was seen a bit more serious about uh, in, when it comes to football. The thing with, with with Islam and football is that the more higher you go, the more difficult it becomes. Mm. Especially at amateur sort of level, uh, there's not there's not many there's not many clubs that you'll go to that you're not going to get sort of sort of racial discrimination. Mm. That's not gonna that that's gonna happen. Okay. That's that's inevitable. Mm. So there's many a times playing semi pro football, running down the line, and you know you've got young kids on the sideline saying, "Oh, suicide bomber," calling you, going to a stadium, walking in, and people calling you Bin Laden. This used to happen all the time, okay. but it's just how you how you deal with it, how you tackle those things. Um, and in two thousand and one, uh, when this was all going on, 
there was quite a few people looking at us and thinking, oh, what's going on here? Like, these guys are getting discriminated. Obviously, uh, you know, 9-11 has happened. And what's going on? Here? This, this something's <coughs> not right here. Mm. So we was followed by the BBC for a, a whole year. So they made a documentary about myself and two guys uh, about being Muslim and playing football uh, in, in the UK. Mm. Um, and that showed a lot of light uh, in, in the discrimination that we was going through and the, the problems that we was going through. But, you know, I don't know, 24 years on, I don't think any cha anything changed. Mm. I think everything is still the same. I was actually having a conversation with a brother last night about the same thing. Like 40 years of football life's gone by. Um, and 40 years ago, we was talking about being discriminated, being South Asian. Um, and 40 in, years, they're still talking about it. And we're still talking about it now. We're still talking about the same situation right now. Mm. We've had, I mean, we were told you don't have refs, you don't have managers, you don't have clubs, you don't have professional footballers. We've got everything now. Mm. What don't we have? We have everything, but there's still the discrimination still goes on. So yeah, it was hard. It was difficult. Uh, praying was difficult. Um, did you feel you had to hide it? I did in the beginning. I did in the beginning. I, I hid a lot of it. Um, you know, I, I, I kind of used to, um, I used to kind of combine my salah. Um, thinking that, you know, I have to pray in it. So, but these guys are going to find it a bit awkward because the football scene at that time was everyone's in the change room, you know, you know, yeah. everyone's, you know, doing, uh, getting up to all types of madness. Mm -hmm. They want to shower together. They want to do everything together. They want to go back on the bus together. They want to do the, they want to drink on the way home together. The culture was like that. Mm -hmm. So it's whether you're going to adopt it or you're not going to adopt it. And I think the thing is with sort of these non-D clubs, once you, once you fall into that criteria, you're part of them. Mm. And you're not gonna get you're not gonna get away from it. And if you don't go to their parties and you don't do them things, which I never did any of those things, they kind of think, mm, you know, this guy's a bit of an outcast. Yeah, yeah. He's not doesn't really, you know, fit yeah. our football culture. Yeah, yeah. Don't you think though? Last let's say five, six, seven years, big shift and a big change. And the reason you know Allah knows best, but you got prominent Muslim players in prominent clubs. And, you know, they are proud of themselves being Muslim. Like Paul Pogba, Muhammad Salah, yeah, you know, and many others. So Jude is being done. Uh, somebody sent me a clip a couple of weeks ago. I don't know how old it, uh, the actual video was, but it's Liverpool fans saying something like, Muhammad Salah, a gift from Allah. Yeah. Uh, have you seen, have you heard that? Yeah, yeah, it's a song they sing, yeah. Yeah, yeah? so, yeah. I mean, look, you're going to hear that 10, 20 years ago. Yeah. You know, most clubs, not, okay, maybe not most, but, you know, there, there's some clubs that have prayer rooms facilitating, you know, prayer for Muslims. Yeah. You've got Nujum Sports, you know, yeah, yeah. Nujum Sports who kind of like engage with clubs and support them concerning Islam and so on. So don't you think now, right now, 2024, it's a big, much different. Yeah, there, 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 is, a, a, there is a shift of narrative. Obviously, there, 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 there has been. Um, but I think the shift in the narrative probably has only shifted like that because these are world-renowned stars, you know, Paul Pogba was a star um, in the making as he when he came to Man United. Yeah. Mohamed Salah was a star from Egypt and he came to the came to the UK. He was already a star, but I'm saying that uh, and, and they've done a lot. Don't get me wrong, they've done a lot uh, in terms of establishing um, their football careers alongside the Islam, and yeah. they've shown everyone a great uh, sort of light into being Muslim and being able to play at the professional sort of level. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's 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 no doubt about that. And and obviously with, you know, our brothers at No German and all this stuff and the, you know, the barriers that they're breaking to get into those clubs and talk to them. Um, but I still think, uh, I, 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 this is just my personal belief, uh, I still think there's a lot that can be done. A lot more openness can be there. Mm. Um, will, it, will it ever get there? I don't know. Okay. Only because football is, it's, it, it is with, whether you like it or not. It's, it's a white cultural sport, mm -hmm. whether you like it or not, um, and it's predominantly them. Mm -hmm. So, do they adopt those things, uh, you know, wholeheartedly about Muhammad Salah being Muslim, or are they just making a song about him uh, by his name? Yeah. I, I, you know, I, I don't know. The only thing I would say to that is, you see, like, look, credit to your mum. You went into the football. You're good at school. In, in football, mum said, "Fine, go train, play, come home." A lot of Muslim parents. You know, across the board, I'm talking about even on Asian parents, they might be, you know, from Africa, they might be from Arabia, Somalia, so on. So look, football, what kind of career is that? Mm. Yeah, that encouragement would not be there to be a footballer or a boxer and so on. Very few parents would have that kind of open-mindedness. Uh, what I'm trying to say is there's also a, what's the word I'm looking for? 
a reluctance or let's say an isolation by Muslims, especially before, concerning their youngsters being involved because look, it's non-Muslim kind of like environment and so on. That long term doesn't really help. You know, youngsters need to be pushed. And look, football, like you said, kept you a lot of our trouble. Yeah, alhamdulillah. If we did that with a lot of youngsters, not everybody can be a madrasa student. But you know what? Okay, fine. Do boxing, do football, do that. Be active, come home. Yeah. But, and then just, you know, doing something you don't enjoy, but at, at, at the same time, you're going to be on the streets and so on. Yeah. So some of those two angles, I don't know, what's your take on that? So so, so with 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 regards to youngsters, I mean, I, I was running a football academy for 15 years um, with the, uh, with Al Nur School. Um, we only stopped it because of the COVID, uh, what happened with COVID, but we used to have a lot of Muslim kids come and go, come and go all the time. And up on average, on a Saturday, we could have up to 100 boys training with, with us from the age of five up to 13. Most of the parents... I would say majority of the parents actually would be very reluctant to take their children to professional clubs or professional setups, um, whether it be with, through training or whether through matches or whatever, only because of those reasons, yeah. because they were very scared. Mm -hmm. They used to think that, you know what, we've got our children in a, in like Molly cottoned up in a, in a little bubble. Let's just keep them like that. As long as they're in our environments and, and they stick within our culture, um, our religious boundaries, nothing is going to really affect them. But the truth of the matter is, if they don't go out into the wider world and they don't see other cultures, they will struggle in life because when they want to play sport, it's going to become difficult to play against someone or be around someone who doesn't have the same religious or ethnic or whatever values with you. It's, 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 always, it's always going to be the case. And the ones who do go and do it, they actually really excel. I mean, we got, I got friends that I got young boys at Culture Star, at Brighton of Albion, uh, West Brom. I got I got good friends that I've got their kids there. If you ask them now, um, would you have done this five years ago? They would say no, mm -hmm. because they were scared themselves. But their children have shown some talent. And the thing is, when when you get ta when you got good talent and you go and express your talent in those environments. It's very hard to reject that. Mm -hmm. It's very, very, it's very difficult. And I, I would always say, that, you know, people need to open their minds. The first thing we need to do is have our children playing and have our parents watching. Mm -hmm. I think this is the biggest problem. Yeah, hundred percent. Because when you go to a, when you go to watch uh, youth football, yeah. <laughs> most of the time, no Muslim parents, no Muslim parents turn up. <coughs> no Muslim parents turn up. It's always the English or the or the or the white guys or the black guys who are standing on the sideline watching their kids play football. Mm -hmm. Our parents just. You know, that's not their field. No, I mean, it, it, there's a, there's a Friday night session that London APSA runs. Um, most of the Asian parents who come there, they're sitting in the car park eating samosas and 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 drinking tea, rather rather than watching their son play football. Mm. And then when the son's upset because he maybe got the ball kicked in his face or he didn't score a goal today or whatever, how are you going to relate to that guy? Mm. And you don't have to be a footballing person. You just got to be active. You just got to be involved. Mm. In anything your 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 child is, I mean, I got my own, my own son plays football. My son's twenty six years old. Yeah. He plays football. I, you know, I still go watch him play. You know, he's playing semi pro. I, I watch him play. I, I I'm actively involved mm. in his, his his upbringing from when he was young. When he was, I mean, he got a football when he was like when he <laughs> took his first step. Um, so he he got a football straight away. Here you so, go, son. This is your future. Yeah, this is your future, son. Um, so like that, like that. <coughs> Parental involvement, that's a key thing. I think the other thing is, it's like, you know what? Giving our youngsters confidence. One brother told me last week, he's a Rebert brother. He said, you know what? Like uh, the young Somali boys. See, a lot of Somali boys, or, 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 or maybe Somalis in general, there's a sense of confidence. So what's happened in schools? Somali boys in schools are like, you know what? We're Muslim. And that confidence is having an impact in schools with young non-Muslim boys. And they're bringing them to the masjids like shahada. Yeah. You know, look, your must a sense of confidence. Because the thing is, you can't really hide away. Like the world's too too global now. Yeah. They say, look, no, they can't do it. They can't. No, you can, but these are the boundaries, and you got to be confident with your deen. Yeah. So I think that we got to kind of like explore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With, and, and the thing with with sport also, it gives you discipline, doesn't it? It gives you some sort of discipline of being able to eat right, mm. train right, be on time, leave on time you know, ha have good manners to, to your coaches and that, that stems off onto your parents and everyone around you. Mm. But if you, if you, if you look if, if historically, if, if, if I look back in the eighties and nineties growing up, if I look even back to some of my friends that were up to their sort of madness, now they're a lot older. Where are some of them? 
Some of them are either in prison, some of them are dead, you know, uh, for various reasons, car crashes, you know, stabbings, shooting, all of this kind of stuff. They, that's where they are because they also were good at those things. They also were good at football, but they never used that as their discipline. What they did is for, you know what, we'll have two lives. At home, we're just going to be very, very nice and very, you know, calm and stuff. But outside, they wanted to run their, you know, whatever whatever madness they were running outside. They just wanted to run their madness outside. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it does add a lot of discipline. So if parents cannot see, it doesn't have to be football. Yeah, it, it could it, be it, anything. It could be anything. It could be anything. It, it it's could just, be anything. It's just that if, even as you lot was talking about, I, I remember um, my son, I took him to football. And I don't, usually I don't have the time to go see him. So similar to what you're talking about, about not just taking samosas maybe, but it's a bit busy with work, actually. <laughs> but, you know, my wife kicked it in my head, like, you know what, you don't really, you don't really take your son to like uh, football and things like that. And it shouldn't be for the mum per se to watch her son. So I said, you know, all right, cool, I'll start taking him. And one day I just went with her and I watched him. And as soon as he saw me, it's like an energy bolt grew in him and yeah. he just started running left, right, center, tackling, da, da, da. My wife's like, did you see the difference? When I'm there, he sees his mum, but he's not trying to impress me. But when he sees you there, it's like he wants to impress you and show you he can do this and that. Yeah. So the influence of a parent, just being there, you don't even have to say anything. Just being there saying, you know what, son, or daughter, if she's doing something, uh, you know, like for her, I'm here to watch you. Yeah. That alone gives them that sense of confidence. It's, it's yeah. an encouragement as well. Mm. And I mean, they say, look, that, you know, like home and away games. Why? Why is it in home? Okay. Because you know you got more supporters. Mm. That boosts you. Mm. That gives you more motivation and confidence. So, yeah. so same thing when parents are involved. Mm. And, and and look at that. It's a hard. You know, most like he said, you can go to a kids match now, Muslim kids, mm. and you might find one parent, yeah. but that's the guy who drove the minibus because he had. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, there's nobody there. The other, the non-Muslim players, yeah. all the parents are yeah. there shouting, screaming. Mm. Yeah, and it, do, it doesn't even matter how good the, how the good yeah. uh, the boy might be. Yeah. He might not even be that great. Yeah. But the, the fact that they're turning up there and they're making sure that they're watching, you know, his his, his progress on whatever he's doing, mm. you know, it's a boost for the, it's a boost for the boy and. For your son, he, he would see you, he, he probably sees that you're the guy that comes home and you, you probably put the discipline in the house. Mm -hmm. And then he sees you now and he's looking at you thinking, look, well, you know what? That's the guy that's the, the disciplined guy. And now, you know what? He's also going to be, you know, he's also my hero. Mm -hmm. And I want to I wanna show off in front of him. Mm -hmm. And it is a, it's an element of showing off, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. He wants to show off in front of you and say, you know what, dad? You know what, when I did that, you know what? Yeah. You know, I get other kids saying to me, oh, coach, coach, did you see when I, when I did that? Yeah, when I, when I, when I, when I they want you to see it. And, they, and, they want you, they want and to show them that you saw it and appreciate you. And exactly. Yeah. Don't tell exactly. him that. Don't tell him that. He's going to say, well, sure Ria. Yeah. No, that ain't right. Is it, yeah, you know, not the last one. Is it one of those? He's the real one, Achi. He already knows this. That's why he wasn't to bring these jokes up now. Huh? But yeah. And I, I'm, I'm sure we, we, we're talking about the right type of showing off. Yeah, no. Nah. <coughs> well, one, one, he's young. Yeah. He's, he's at that time, he would have been eight, nine. Of course, at See, 20 years he's old, he's not going to be like, yes, and he's there and... <laughs> <laughs> Stop yeah. punching people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You Stop know, I'm like, like son, look, I know I'm here, mate, but calm down, yeah. But yeah. when he's young, actually, you're not gonna knock him for showing off. That's just young. Do, do, do you know what it is? Is I mean, I don't know how old your kids are, but um, when when you when you when your kids do anything, yeah, you know, when they do anything, um, naturally, when our when we were doing things and we were achieving good things, and our parents were very proud of us in the way we achieved those things and what mm -hmm. we did. And hence the same thing for us, we're now the third generation. Mm -hmm. We're also looking at it the same way, aren't we? We're looking at it now that like when my son does something, like he could score a banger or he could just lead the Salah, Homera, mm -hmm. or you know, and or he could do something like that. Or my daughter. Lusha Moss, you Lusha Moss. He could be leading Lusha Moss. Don't harm the guy, man. Don't harm him. On the football pitch, he was not giving him that privilege yet. Mustafa Khan has, so. So he hasn't given him that privilege yet. But um, so, you know, when, when they're doing those things and, yeah. you know, it, it does give you a sense of achievement and there's, it, it is a moment that you're, you're very happy, you know, mm. Allah puts this kind of this saqeena in your heart in it that, you know, that you brought your, your children up in a certain way and, mm. and they've achieved something good in their lives. Absolutely. And I just don't think that should only just be exams mm. or doing well in education. It should be across the board. Mm. It should be everything. And we have to keep working harder and harder and harder to make sure that our children keep achieving and keep being, uh, 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 those those people in society that when they grow up and the next generation comes behind them, they will see them as their heroes and their mentors and stuff like Inshallah. that. And and that continues that way. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. So moving forward, and um, you said by thirty four you stopped semi pro. 
Yeah. What happened with stopping and then what was the conclusion after that? I only stopped at 34, Akhi, because uh, my son, like I said, he was playing football himself. Um, so I wanted to kind of uh, take it a little bit easy with my football. Um, I, when I say stop, chair, when I, I mean serious stop because yeah, yeah. when you're playing football all your life, it's hard to get away from it. I'm 47 right now, but I'm still playing. Okay. So I play Sundays now. Just play, I play for a, a mate's team, playing Sunday league. Um, but I only, I only calmed it down because family's growing up. My daughters are getting older. They're at the age of getting married. My son's at the age of getting married. So, you know, I've got to, I've got to start looking at those things as well. Obviously, I'm, I, I run my own business. So I had to look at those things as well. So um, football couldn't take up the time that it took up previously. Mm. It couldn't take up that because playing semi-pro, you've got to be training twice a week. You're going to have a midweek game. You're going to have a weekend game. Sometimes you could go nine o'clock in the morning. You're not getting back to seven, eight o'clock in the evening. Mm. So like the whole day's gone by. Obviously, you know, m uh, my wife's at home. My mum's at home. My children at home. I, I have to give them some, mm. I had to give them some time. Even though, alhamdulillah, my wife was very uh, uh, open and very receptive to me playing football coming from a, Footballing family herself, anyway, you know my okay. my, my father in law was a football player himself. Okay. All my brother in laws have played football. My father in law used to have a football club, mm. so we have kind of like a it's, it just a football out. dynasty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want yeah. A, a few points. One is in terms of work. I'll get get to the work maybe. Father in law, because you know English wife's English. Yes. Father in law, you know a bit about that. Come to that, but uh, I want to speak about uh, London Absa. Okay. Yeah. That was a club that you started. Yeah. Uh, when did you start that? What was the vision behind it? So, when we when we went to when we went just before we went to Pakistan, we used to have a predominantly Muslim football team, very similar to how LIC are doing it here. We had a Muslim football team. Um, we just wanted to go it ourselves, only because we felt that there was discrimination. Um, we were struggling with uh, getting into the right leagues, getting onto the right platforms and stuff. So we thought we'd just go it ourselves. So what we did is we set up a team called, the original team was actually called Ahla Sunnah. That was the first team. So we set up that team. <laughs> Should have told him he would have joined the Ahla <laughs> <laughs> So we set up that team, alhamdulillah. Um, we did very well. Yeah. Uh, we had a lot of success from it, alhamdulillah. And then from that team, because people were seeing a lot of our success, a lot of, lot of new players were coming and joining us and whatever. So we had a lot of players join. From there, we had some trials. Like I said, a few of us went to pa Pakistan to play against the national team and uh, do a tour around Pakistan and stuff. Um, when we came back from that, we thought to ourselves, you know what, we just got to make an elite team. It's just going to be elite and we're just going to go at everyone. And we're not going to play in, you know, the sort of like the, you know, the, the, the backstreet leagues no more. We're just going to hit the big leagues and we're just going to go all at it. Obviously it was difficult, no money, no finances, no sponsorships, who's going to sponsor us and stuff like this. Um, but amongst us, Hamdra, there were some older older brothers and they they had uh, prominent businesses and one of them being Kababish, Kababish original, uh, brother uh, Anjum um, and his brother Amjad, they they backed us and they said, look, you know what, if you're going to go for it, we're going to we're gonna help you. And this is another thing, you know, that whenever you embark on these journeys, someone's got to be at the back supporting you and helping you, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and that could be a father helping his son with the right boots and the right kit and all those kind of things. Or it could be good brothers around you who've got establish businesses, sponsorship money, buy you a kit, buy you the whole thing and, and, and you know, get you on that that, that, that stepping stone to, to start moving. Mm. So we entered those leagues, but alhamdulillah, year on year, we kept on winning the leagues. We went from fifth division to the premier division. We beat the, we won the premier division. Um, we went to uh, championships and we were predominantly, like I said, a Muslim football team. Most of, most, all, of our, all of our guys were majority Muslim. Maybe yeah, the odd non-Muslim here and there, but majority of us were, were Muslim. Mm. And even the ones that were non-Muslims, like Brother Glenn, took Shahada, became Muslim with us. Inshallah. And weird story, uh, I'll just quickly tell you on this. We actually we, we, we actually met Glenn two weeks before that. So two weeks before that, we met him. He came for a trial, got into the team. We went to play in a, in a league match um, in Barkingside somewhere. We've got to Barkingside Stadium and Qadr Allah, they can't get the lights on for the stadium. The lights don't, they're not working. So obviously when you're playing that level, if the lights don't work in the evening, you ain't, the match is not going to go on. So they tried for about an hour and a half, called electricians down or whatever, to try and uh, get the lights to work. Lights never worked. So in that period, we're talking to Glenn about Islam, you know, what do you know about, Mus you know, about Islam? What do you know about Muslims? Well, alhamdulillah, there's a few of us, alhamdulillah gave him some dawah. So we managed to speak to him for about an hour and a half. And he said, look, I, I don't want to go home now. You know, I want to take my shahada today. 
Mashallah. It has to be done today. Mm. So man, relax, man. Just keep talking. We'll keep giving you some advice, give you some books. Maybe you know, have a read of the Quran. He said, no, 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 no. I, I don't want to go home because if I die tonight and I'm not Muslim, that's going to be problematic for me. Mm. So I want to become Muslim. And he was one of the guys, mashallah, that day he took shahada, um, became Muslim, alhamdulillah, with us, and then played with us for, I don't know, five, six years on after that. He went, we moved back to Wolverhampton, but he stayed with us for, for a long time. Inshallah. So London Absa was born from that. Success came, uh, uh, you know, with TV coverage, being on Match of the Day. We were the only club ever, uh, Muslim club that ever was featured on Match of the Day. Uh, we, played, we played in the FA Cup. We played in the FA Vars, was getting a lot of exposure from it. Um, we went uh, to Scotland, played in the UK Asian Championships. We won those. We were, we were the first Asian club to win uh, um, the tournament at Chelsea, at Stamford Bridge. So we done that as well. Uh, we went to Manchester. We won the Umbro Cup, which no Asian team had ever won in the 20 year history of having a, a, a cup in Manchester. Um, so we done all of those kind of things. So we had a lot of success early days. So London Absa was the, the you know the, the 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 birthplace of a lot of the guys from lots sort of East London that, mm. that you know mashallah played football. Mm. And alhamdulillah, even till now, London Absa still runs. Okay. Um, it runs in, as an academy set up. So Friday nights, we've got over like 70, 80 boys that come on a regular basis, um, Muslim and non-Muslim, and they come. The club's got an established name. They come and they train. Get a lot of good coaching from a lot of the a lot of the brothers that used to play. Some don't play no more, mm. and they and they're still getting some fantastic coaching with them. Mashallah. Oh, mashallah. Sounds mashallah. very good. What is, it, what is it? What does the name stand for? The London what? Do you know the weird thing is? Yeah, the the, the London APSA thing, APSA actually stands for Anglo Pack Sports Association, but because we wanted to be more inclusive, and we wanted to hit obviously mainstream football, um, and there was some frowning about very similar to what you're doing right now. <laughs> uh, about what? what Anglo Pak? What's that? Yeah, because we're predominantly Pakistani guys. Yeah, yeah. When you when you start and did Anglo, so we can Anglo. Yeah, so the, we changed it to the All People Sports Association. <laughs> <laughs> Big change, yeah. Yeah, so we changed it to the All People. All People, okay. Yeah. So not Anglo. Yeah, yeah. The Anglo Pak. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it kind of it, it kind of went away very very quickly because everyone used to go. Like, so what does APSA stand for? Because some people used to think APSA was just like a like a. Uh, an Asian kind of name. Yeah, yeah. It's like London or oh, Apsa. It's, like, it's like some village in your, in yeah. your country or something like that. That's what everyone used to think in the beginning. It's only when we started telling people and everyone started going, what? Yeah. <laughs> What's that all about? You must um, have had someone that just became a doctor in your football team or something. Let's just call it Apsa. It stands for APCC. <laughs> it's like, what? Yeah, yeah. It could have been. It could have been no, like that as well. Yeah. Allah. Okay, cool. Moving forward, just wanted to ask about uh, marriage, father-in-law. Uh, you know, how was the, like in terms of uh, uh, father-in-law being non-Muslim, you being a Muslim, marrying his daughter, and, and the how did they take that? Okay, uh, um, I shouldn't dwell too much on how we got together and all that kind of stuff, because that might fall into something something a bit wrong. Um, obviously, I knew my wife from a very young age. We went to the same school together, um, but we didn't know each other at school. Uh, we got to know each other after that. Um, alhamdulillah, my wife, uh, mashallah, she took, she took shahada at the age of, I think, 17. 16, 17, she took, took shahada with uh, Ustad Murtaza Khan's uh, uh, wife. Um, and when she became Muslim, obviously, we, we'd obviously known of each other. Um, there was always this kind of, this, uh, this want to get married, but get married at a young age mm. and not leave it too long. But me being the boy or the guy was always prolonging things. And she was always saying, look, you know what? I'm Muslim. Let's just get married. Let's just sort it out. And I always used to say to her, look, but your dad and your mum's not going to be happy about it. They're born and bred in Canning Town. Uh, my father obviously was like a West Ham hardcore guy. You know, would they be all right with it? Mm -hmm. You know, um, and she said, look, you know what, whether they're all right with it or not, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. If that's something we want, um, that's something we're going we're, we're gonna to have to work towards. So that was one fair factor. The other fair factor was my mum, because I'm thinking... Obviously, growing up, my mum's always telling me, "Oh, you know, you're gonna, we're gonna go back home one day, and you know, my sister, her daughter, you know, your your khala's, uh, your khala's uh, <laughs> yeah. daughter's ready. You know, she's within gonna get the family. Yeah, yeah within the family, she's, you're gonna get married. You know, she goes to English school. She's learning the language and all this. Stuff. One day, you're gonna marry her and come back. So me, I'm thinking to myself, like, how am I gonna break this to my mum mm. that I don't want to marry her and I want to marry someone else? Mm. And on top of that, she's English white." 
<laughs> the way he said it. <laughs> why? It was it a big problem to be English white? Yeah, for, for, uh, for culturally, for us, bro. Look, if you yeah? think about it, no one's ever done that. Okay. Like in our families or in our, in our sort of culture, in our areas, no one's ever done that. Okay. No one ever did that. So I'm, I literally like literally tip that balance. Mm -hmm. So my, I'm worried, scared. So the only go-to person I had was my sister, my older sister. So I spoke to my older sister about it. Uh, and then my sister spoke to my mum. And uh, my mum being my mum and my dad, she became my dad that day and said, she said, she picked up the phone, she phoned me and she said, where is she? And I said, uh, who? She goes, you know who I'm talking about, where is she? I said, uh, she's at a house. She's gonna pick her up, bring her home. And there's me thinking now, I'm gonna get beats and she's gonna get beats with me. <laughs> so how am I gonna, how am I gonna overcome this? Obviously I had to, I had to bite the bullet, spoke to my sister, went there, picked her up, brought her home, got to the door, and my mum opened the door, she let her in. I'm walking in, she says, get out. To you're you? not coming, yeah, you're not coming in. Oh, okay. So okay, fair enough. <laughs> not coming in. I went. Five, six hours have gone by. I haven't heard from anybody, my sisters, my mum, no one. My mum phones me up about five hours later, five, six hours later, she phones me and she says, come to the house. I said, okay. So I got to the house. Again, not coming in. Go and drop her home. <laughs> Shut up. I said, okay. Got her back in the car. She's crying her eyes out. Um, she's got some bags and stuff. She's crying her eyes out. She's not really speaking. So I've dropped her home. And she says, Look, just drop me home. I just want to go home. So I dropped her home, scared again to go home, sneaked into the through the back door, got in. Um, and my mum said to me, uh, do you want to marry her? I said, yeah. She said, on one condition. I said, what's that? You're going to get married straight away. I was only 20 years old. Mm -hmm. You're going to get married straight away. No messing around, straight away. I said, okay, no problem. I'll do it. So I'm thinking now, my mum has... All her dreams, I've just shattered them. Mm -hmm. I've shattered all the dreams that she had. But being that mum and the dad that she was, she didn't want to shatter mine. Mm. She bit every bullet. Every pain she had, she just took it away. She said, look, you know what? If this is your dream and this is what you want to do, I don't care. I know people are going to say, you know, you married a Gordy. Gordy mean white. You marry someone out of your culture. You know, they like this, they like that. I know I'm going to hear all of those things, but I don't care. Mm. I'll take on the whole world just that if you're happy. Mm. I said, okay, no problem. So, alhamdulillah, six weeks later, we organised a little haul. Uh, Sheikh Abu Hanifa done my, my, my nikah. Had about 60, 70 people. Rode next to mine in an old church place. They had a hall. I did, I set up the whole wedding myself. I laid out the tables myself. You know, I helped feed all the people myself. I cleared up the hall myself. Um, got married, alhamdulillah, and uh, bought, my, bought, bought my wife home. What about her family? Were they involved in the nikah? So, my, my, so I, I was going to say that my, 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 my mother-in-law had met me. Okay. Um, obviously, back then, I didn't have a big beard and all this kind of stuff. I obviously had a little bit of a beard, but not a big beard and stuff. And she just said she was okay. You know, I think one thing about, you know, I think there's a, there's a misconception about, you know, English culture that, you know, they're very against all of this kind of stuff. And, and I think they're not. I generally think they're quite open about allowing their par their children to make the right decision. They're probably a bit more open than our people. Yeah, they are open. <laughs> I'll, I'll make probably, your own I'll probably make the push right that much. I think I think it's our people. Yeah. That's like, nah, not them people. Yeah, yeah. They were, yeah. They were very open about it. And I remember just getting one phone call off my father-in-law and he just said to me, he said to me, look, you know what? I'm not going to come to the wedding. As a matter of fact, no one of our family is going to come to the wedding. I'm not happy about this. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not happy about it. But if that's what she wants to do and that's what you want to do, then I'm not, I can't stand in her way. Um, but if you if you if I find out that you do anything to my daughter because of what he obviously thinks Asian men do to their women, um, it's me you're gonna deal with. Mm. And I know what his background is and where he comes from, his friends and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I had to kind of like think, okay, wherever it is, I have to I have to accept it. Um, but as years went on, obviously my son was born and whatever. I mean, they never they never came to our wedding. They never even came to see us after for many years. Super after man. they never did. Mum was the mother-in-law was okay. She was all right. Her grandparents were okay. 
Um, Because she mainly used to live with her grandparents because her mum and dad lived uh, out out in Hornchurch somewhere. So she lived with, used to live with her grandparents a lot. And they were, mashallah, very, they 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 they, they loved us. They loved me. They loved my my mum. The grandparents. Yeah, yeah. They loved us. Um, fast forward a year or two, a year later, my son Bilal was born. And obviously when the child's born, that's their first grad, grandchild. Mm. They want to see him. Okay. Um, so they wanted to see him. Um, once they met Bilal, uh, I think all of the sorrow and all of the anger and everything, it just, you know, Allah just took it all away. Mm. It just completely went away. And then, you know, again, like I said, fast forward now, I've been married 27 years. Mashallah. I think, my, mashallah, my, my father-in-law, I, I can't say a bad word about him. Mm. Mashallah, he's a fantastic guy. He's got a lot of love and a lot of respect for us. He's got a lot of respect and love for Islam. Uh, my mother-in-law being the same. Um, they, they're more advocates uh, for Muslims than I think probably some Muslims might be. Mm. If anyone says anything about Muslims, they'll be the first one to say, no, no, no. You're, you're chatting it because my, my son my, my son was not like that. <laughs> and he's a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a religious guy. He's a real Muslim. He's, he's, a real he's got Muslim. a big beard and everything. Yeah, <laughs> he's a real guy. <coughs> he's not like that. Yeah. You know? And even my, my, my father and I, my father had a football club for like eight, nine years. We used to go to the club, um, you know, go and watch all the games and everything. And we used to be like celebrities there. Mashallah. Because what could anyone say to us? Mm. You're the chairman, son-in-law. My, my son used to go, I used to go. Um, what could they say to us? Mm. We used to sit in the VIP seats and everything. Like, the whole, like eight, nine hundred thousand fans were looking at us thinking like, wow, Mashallah. what's going on here? Mm. But Alhamdulillah, it broke a lot of those those cultural sort of barriers and whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and, my, and, and, and it helped us a lot in our lives. They, look, they helped us with loads of things. You know, I, I, I don't want to sort of diminish the 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 help that they gave us but you know the support network as much as people might think it wasn't there it was you know it, it was it was it was there a lot of love from them um and later on later on um my my wife's grand grandfather um you know uh has passed away now he he was in he was in a, he was in a care home um boxer fought two world wars uh was working in british gas Big giant of a man, um, in his, in his in his prime again, not you know probably never heard anything about Islam or Allah or anything like that. Um, but obviously after meeting us and seeing us and how we were as, as characters, we never really used to push Islam down their throats too much. It was more to do with a little bit subliminal messages talking about Allah, you know, talking about Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and just for our character, just trying to talk to them and guide them. Um, at the age of I think ninety one or ninety two, he took shahada. Allah The granddad. Yeah. yeah, the granddad took shahada. Allah. He took shahada, and um, uh, and he was he was in a care home, so he took shahada with my son. Mm. And it's it's really where uh, it's really uh, uh, miraculous that you know how Allah did all of that as well, you know, for us because we never thought that he would take shahada. You know, he was in a state of dementia. Um, you know, he was remember some things, wouldn't remember some things. But the one person he had a lot of closeness to was my son, as well as my wife. The older son, Bilal. Yeah. So he used to, whenever Bilal used to go around, he used to sit him on his lap, you know, just sit him in his lap, tell him about war stories and, you know, talk to him about West Ham and, you know, all of these kind of things. So he had a very, very closeness to, to my son. So my son used to, you know, in his, in his last sort of few months of the year of his life, my son used to go there a lot because he was very close to him. Mm-hmm. And he used to go, to go see him a lot. Granddad, how are you? How's everything? Whatever, whatever. And then he, 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 and they start talking to him about Islam a lot more than what we used to. And if Bilal ever said to uh, to uh, uh, um, his granddad that look, he wanted him to do something or say something, he would never say no. And he said to him that he wanted him to become Muslim. Mm. Subhanallah. Inshallah. He wanted him to. Mm-hmm. So he took Shahada with him. Mm-hmm. So he really loved him that much that yeah. he listened to him. Mashallah. But he believed, because he, 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 he knew Bilal's not going to lie. Mm. He, he knew Bilal's not going to lie and he's not going to tell him something that's not it's not it's not true mm. so he took shahada and then obviously months later he passed away mashallah may Allah accept mm. it from uh, yeah. um, you know I mean. and how Allah had him for 90 odd years um, as a non-Muslim mm. and in his last few years and he didn't even he did from that bed he never moved mm. yeah he never moved from that bed mm. and then we fast forward more the grandma she a year and a half two years ago she took shahada so she t- she's in also in the same care home now, mm. and she's taking shahada. But she took shahada with my with my daughter. 
Okay. Yeah, so she took shahada. My kids are just putting in the work. Yeah, man, they're putting in the work, man. Mashallah. Yeah, they're putting in the work, man. So, um, alhamdulillah, they, 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 she took shahada as well. She's still in the care home. She's in, uh, she's not, she's unwell at the moment. So, dua for her that, you know, that Allah accepts it Ameen. from her. Amen. Um, but she recognizes things. She still recognizes people. She doesn't forget me. She doesn't forget any of the, you know, my, my children, whatever. Mm. We have a very, uh, we have a, we have a very uh, much a closeness as a as a, as a family, um, especially with my in laws. My daughter just recently got married in November. Mm. And I'm sure Kiel knows about that. And uh, we're at the wedding, and I've got like a white side of my family, which a lot of my a lot of like my extended family probably don't know about. And then obviously they've got my Asian side of the uh, Asian side of the family, and mm. and when people see that, they think like even the the hall people. They were uh, she got married somewhere in, in Chelmsford, and even the hall people kept on asking us that, like, what is going on here? Like we just, we just can't, we just can't put, out, can't put out. Like even the girls that work there, I remember them telling, uh, telling my my wife that like, what's going on here? Like, like the mum just coming, she's English white. The boy that came with her, Sam, like he's an English white guy. Like I can't work you out. Are you Moroccan? Are you white? Or what are you? Then you got your kids. They like mixed a little bit. Like what's going on here? So a lot of people were just couldn't, <coughs> couldn't even like the other day we worked under the care home. Walked to the care home and we've all gone together. And uh, the Asian lady came up to me, she, the one of the nurses, she goes, she goes, brother, look, can I ask you something? I said, I think, all right. She goes, yeah. She goes, like, who are these people? And what are you to them? Yeah. She goes, I see you guys coming all the time. I, I look after Jean all the time, but I don't even know who you are. Then I had to break it down to her. Inshallah. Like these are the, the generations. So the great grandma is in the bed. Then the grandma is my, my mother-in-law. Um, then it's my my mum's there as well. Mm -hmm. Then it's my daughter. Then it's my wife. Mm. Then it's my daughters, and they've, that's the that's the that's the steps. Yeah, that's the steps. It goes goes all the way up, man. Subhanallah. Mm. That's but the beauty. It, 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 beauty of Islam. Yeah, that's the beauty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The Prophet practiced that with the Sahaba, Sahabiyat. Awesome. Different ethnicities, but you know what? Deen brings people together. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So for me, for me in those days, doing something like that broke so many barriers for so many young people in our areas where some of them went on to, you know, uh, marry people of different, you know, sort of cultures and backgrounds and mm -hmm. whatever. And I was that guy, you know, that, oh, look, Erfat did it. He got all right. He was all right. Yeah. You know, and I was that kind of that guy that broke those, those uh, a few of those, a few of those yeah, barriers for people, alhamdulillah. Barakallah, fiqh, jazakallah khair. Business-wise, work-wise, you mentioned BNQ. I know now you've got a construction business, maintenance business. Yeah, anything about that? Yeah. So being cute in my life, in my seven years or eight years that I worked at being cute, um, I I thought being cute was my life. I thought I was going to be here till you know, retirement, like everyone else was. Um, being cute helped me a lot through development in terms of understanding business and and working with business and stuff, or working with businessmen. Um, and when I got made store manager. Um, I resigned. And they were a bit thinking like, are you all right? Like you so, just become that, store that's manager. Everyone works towards. Yeah, like everyone works towards that. Why have you Why have you just resigned? Mm. And I resigned only because I just wanted to make my own dreams. Mm. I wanted to put my sweat and blood into something that I made my own dreams from. They kept me back there for about six, seven months, kept on delaying me another month, another month, another month, offering me more money and all that stuff. But I had made my mind up. I had no job to go to. I had a young boy. Um, obviously, I, I, I had no rent and stuff to pay, but I was living at home. Um, so I said, you know what? I'm just going to tawakkal Allah. I'm just going to go for it. I'm, I, I made dua to Allah that, Allah, you know, I'm taking this step because I want to just do something for my life that will make it better for me and for my family. And I had some dreams. I had some serious dreams. And I'll tell you about my dreams. In a, in a, I had some serious dreams. And I couldn't have achieved them if I was at B&Q because the, fin financially, I was not able to do it. Mm -hmm. So I left b &Q. I had no job. And Qadr Allah, two days later, one of my very good friends, Akhtar and Rahim, mashallah, they, they landed a logistics contract with Ford. And uh, they said that, um, do you want to come work for us? And I said, um, I said, I'm not sure because I want to do something for myself. I said, look, while you're doing what you're going to do and work it out, come and work for us. And the weird thing is that Rahim was someone that I employed at B&Q and now he's employing me back for his brother's company uh, uh, with him. Mm. So it was like a role reversal. So I went, I went to work with him for a year. Um, and in that period, um, 
I was always, you know, even from a young age, I've always been very good with my hands in terms of fixing things. Something breaks down, you know, I'll fix it. You know, window's broken, I'll fix it. Uh, you know, you know the old VHS uh, videos, you know, you mm -hmm. put your video in it and uh, it would get caught up in it and I'll just open it up and I'll fix it. You know, I used to do all of those kind of things. So, because I was very handy with that stuff, I thought, you know what, my dad was a carpenter. Um, there must be something in this that I can do. So what I did is I got a toolbox, I put it in the back of my car, and I just went on the road. Spoke to a few people. A couple of times I got a little job here, little job there. Um, didn't earn a lot of money from it, but I just I just went at it. Mm. And then um, I, I went into a partnership with a, with a good brother, mashallah, uh, for about 14 years. We had a partnership together. And slowly, slowly, from me being on my own, um, and then he came along, then there was two of us. Then slowly we employed someone, and then we carried on employing. We landed some contracts, alhamdulillah. We worked very hard, Inshallah. very, very hard. But we just didn't want to be that that typical builder in a white van driving around on his mobile phone. We just didn't want to be that guy. Mm. So I, what we wanted to do is establish a company because there's not many Muslims in the field that kind of like I work in, because uh, I work with social housing. So our work is a lot contractual based. Mm -hmm. So we needed all the accreditations. We needed to have all of those accreditations in place for anyone to even look at us. Because no one looks at you without three years worth of accounts of money going in and out of your business. Mm. No one looks at you if you haven't been vetted before. But alhamdulillah, between myself and him, um, we did all of that. We established the company, got to a certain certain stage. Um, after 14 years, we kind of like, we parted company. Um, so I bought the company, um, uh, 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 I bought the company out. He moved on to something different. Um, and now 20, 22, 23 years on now, Alhamdulillah, I've got about 15, 16 guys that work for me. I've got vans, we've got established contracts. Sure. My son's involved in the business. My wife's involved in the business. Um, I've just recently employed my daughter that got married. She's involved in the business, Alhamdulillah. Um, and we're, as a family, we're just pushing forward to uh, uh, continue that journey of uh, of business, Alhamdulillah. Sure. Sure. You know, just trying to, trying to help anyone and everyone that we can to try and uh, make a better life, and I, and one of the reasons for that, and I was gonna say, was I was I didn't want no ever even before the whole LGBT stuff and all this stuff. I never wanted to send my children to a secular schools. I, I would have homeschooled them at that age, at that time. Um, I just didn't want to do that for two reasons. One, because I didn't believe in the schooling system, mm. um, and I believe that when you go to school, you're gonna meet bad company, and it's just gonna go, mm. it's gonna go wrong. So we was always involved in Al Nur Muslim school, primary school. So I. I being able to work for myself, I, I was able to earn enough money to be able to put all my children through, to, through private schools and all Islamic schools, alhamdulillah, mm. where, uh, you know, by the grace and mercy of Allah, and I can only thank Allah, uh, you know, wholeheartedly, is that two of my children uh, memorize Quran Inshallah. and my son and my eldest daughter. My eldest daughter did it because she was jealous my, my, my son did it, but my son, alhamdulillah, he memorized Quran. And um, for me, that was my ultimate achievement. Mm. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't. I didn't have any other achievements. Mm. I, I didn't want to. I, if I if I look back now, would I say becoming a professional footballer was an achievement that I wanted, knowing that one day Allah would give me a, a half of the son? I didn't want that. I wanted my son to be a half. My son is probably the only half in my whole family, Mashallah. in my whole generation. Mashallah. So that this is what this is what we work for. This is what we aim for. And, mm -hmm. um, and this also coming from the fact that. Being married to my, my wife, who was English, um, she obviously couldn't read Quran at that time. So she used to teach Allah Mubarak, you know, I, I can still remember back now, you know, his, his tahfiz, his, his, his muraja was done with my wife, predominantly with my wife, mm. not so much with me because I was out working or I was out playing football. So the, all the muraja used to be done my, with my wife through transliteration. Mashallah. Mashallah. So I mean the, revision. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so in the early, early years of at least up to I would say eight or nine juz of Quran, my 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 Gosh. wife was doing it through transliteration, alhamdulillah. Mm -hmm. um, which in itself is a miracle of the Quran in itself. That how can someone who comes from that background being able to, through transliteration, be able to check his 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 sabak dur on a regular, you know, so regular sort of basis, mm -hmm. alhamdulillah. Mm -hmm. And a beautiful job with the family, man. May Allah bless you with it, Shaykh. Alhamdulillah. So with the business now, it's been running 22 years. 22 years, yeah. Limited everything. Sorry? Limited. Limited company, yeah. Alhamdulillah, yeah. Allah bless you as well. Allah bless you. What, what advice would you have for, say, other young Muslims thinking about starting construction business or any business for that matter? You know what? First of all, it, it, it's about... Uh, one thing I always say to everyone, and, and I've employed a lot of people. I've got people that have... 
I've got people working for me that have been in prison for 17 years. Mm. You know, murder charges have come out. I've got people that are work with me that have been on drugs and, and being in rehab clinics, but they work for me now. But I always have this one thing for them. I always say to them that, look, don't have the money as your motive. Because once money becomes your motive, you'll never learn. Mm. You know, I in my in my first year, year and a half, I hardly earned any money. Hardly earned any money, and I was struggling. Mm -hmm. But I always wanted to learn, and I always and I still to this day, I still say I'm still on the tools. I still go out. I still go and look at jobs. I still repair mm. toilets, fit doors, refurb houses, do construction. I still do all of that stuff. Mm. But my money, the money was not the motivation, mm. because if you go out and you want to work hard and you want to learn, you're gonna to have to put the time. And you're gonna to have to put the effort. But if every single day the effort and the and, and the learning is not there, but at the end of it, you're always looking at how much money you're gonna earn, the motivation's gonna go away. Mm -hmm. And in all the years that we've worked, we've had many people come and go. The ones that were the motivation was learning to become a gas engineer or become an electrician or become a good carpenter, you know, or even a good paint and decorator, those guys excelled mm -hmm. and they did very, very well. Now they alhamdulillah have their own companies mm -hmm. and we work together. So we bring them back in, we work with them, we work the electricians, we work with these guys mm -hmm. because their motivation was that now, alhamdulillah, they're earning very good money. Yes. So my advice to any youngster, go and learn. Mm. Learning is the key. Once you learn, and that doesn't mean you have to go to college and do NVQs and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. You know, even if you learn with someone, yeah. someone skilled, mm -hmm. maybe maybe it's your maybe it's your father, mm. maybe it's your uncle, it could be anybody. You know, you know, children these days are very reluctant to work with their their families, isn't it? Because they, they think that you know my dad or my uncle is going to be a bit oppress oppressive to me. Don't worry about that. Mm. Just Shouldn't learn for the sake of learning. Learn for the sake of learning. Mm -hmm. And it, it, no matter what happens, that person is in that position because he also did learn. And he is going to pass on some of his skills, um, the good things and the bad things to you. Mm -hmm. So you just got to keep progressing. You got to keep learning. Mm -hmm. And I think I think that's the key to a lot of success. If you know, if I look at successful businessmen around me, you know, I say the same thing to them. I mean, even with 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 Rana, you know, one of the you know, biggest advices I gave him was that you got to you have to learn because if you don't learn business and you don't learn how you know, because there's going to be times where you're going to be down. And there's going to be times that you're going to be up. Mm -hmm. But if you never, if you didn't learn you how just... you get there, or how you are, how you get out when you're down, or how you progress when you're up, mm -hmm. then that's going to be a problem for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because that is a problem for people. Some people they make a lot of money and they do very, very good in business, and 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 they end up losing everything mm -hmm. because they don't know how to control it. So, and they didn't learn in between that. Exactly, they didn't learn anything in between it. Khair. Mm khair, -hmm. Very insightful. I think uh, very beneficial so with regards to the whole interact into marriage relationship and, and the business side of things. So, Jazakumullah khair, and we'll catch you on the next one, inshallah. Inshallah, Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum.